If we can go back to March 14th, you finished the idea Dorado, I think, around just before 6.30. Can you explain, yep. after you finish the race, where do you take your dogs sure. and when does a drug test happen? So I, I had a pretty hard race into the last part. You know, I was running and pedaling. It was a close finish. Um, you know, it was, I, think it, I hope it was exciting for the fans because it was fatiguing for me. I know that. So I crossed the finish line. Uh, we do the snacking of the dogs in the chute. My handlers were there. Um, you know, we send out the food to Nome beforehand, so they had to have snacks. They snack the dogs in the chute, and then we take them down to the the Nome dog yard, which is I think you're familiar with the area. And um, the handlers and some helpers. I only had a small team, right? So they unhooked the dogs, and I'm kind of just standing there, leaning on something, trying not to fall over. And uh, once the dogs get put away, embedded down, um, I headed up to airport pizza along with the rest of my crew. We all kind of were up there for a little bit. And um, then I checked out, right? I crashed for the next 16 hours. Uh, we just finished a thousand mile race. And six hours later, would have been shortly after midnight, my handlers returned to the dog yard um, for the urine test that the dogs do. We all know we had the drug test after the race. And it's taken me two years to get this lined out, but I also did a series of blood tests on the dogs after the race that I had coordinated with, with the, the ITC and some of their vets to actually do the blood draws for us. And then we, they helped us get that to the clinic that could then spin the vials and so that we could have the same exact blood test we do prior to the race. Um, and that happened six hours later. As you know, on the Iditarod, mushers generally stop and rest their dogs for four to six hours is a very normal time frame. And uh, every year after the Iditarod, I, I want to be able to get those dogs bedded down, get them fed, and let them at least have a normal rest length before we wake them up and do the urine test. I'm not the only musher that does that. A lot of mushers do the same thing. It's much easier to get the urine test as well if the dogs have rested, they've eaten and drank. So when they stand up and wake up, what's the first thing they do? They, they pee on something. Anyway, so they took those blood tests and the urine test at that time, um, I was very disappointed as an aside, I was very disappointed in how the race released that as though it was some special exception to wait six hours. Where if you look at the press release of October 9th, I think you have it in front of you there, and it states that we are subject to have a blood test from the pre-race vet check until six hours after the race. There's no special exception. Um, anyway, so then those, those blood tests go off and do their thing. Um, you know, after that, I guess the next pertinent piece of information might be um, every year after the race, the IOFC has a meeting, our annual meeting. The IOFC is the Iditarod Official Finishers Club, and in that meeting I related to the rest of the IOFC members my experience dealing with the ITC board and their handling of the two-way communication rules and also the trailer rules. Um, largely based on some of the things that I was relaying, um, our sitting IOFC board president was all but unanimously, all but two people, um, voted to have him removed and replaced with a new musher rep. Um, he was justifiably, I think, not very happy about that. Um, we've been back and forth, but we should be able to argue about issues on the Iditarod and be okay at the end of the day. Anyway, so then... Can we just pause quick? So the additional blood tests that you had taken, mm -hmm. is, was this the first year for that or did you do that every year? No, this is the first year I've ever done that. Okay. I've been trying to get it lined out and the purpose for that is I want to see how the dogs recover after the Iditarod. If we look at these levels, just one snapshot in their existence um, right before the Iditarod and I believe that these same blood tests could help us establish better training regimens to know when we do a run with the dogs and they become fatigued in that run, when are they fully recuperated? How much time do we really need to give them? Right now we do a fair bit of, you know, kind of uh, cowboy math. You know, ah, they look good, let's go. Um, but let's get some scientific data behind this. Let's see after a dog runs the Iditarod, what do their blood levels do six hours later, 12 hours later, 24 hours later? This is valuable information that I can hopefully work into my training regimens down the road. We can learn more about the dogs that we're mushing. Now, I discussed this with the ITC, like they're going to help me analyze this. Does it really seem plausible that in addition to the urine test, I'm doing blood tests? 
and I'm gonna dope my own dogs before this, when I know that in addition to the urine test, I'm handing this stuff over? I mean, this is absolutely asinine. And where I feel like the, the ITC in part has kind of thrown me under the bus is they're now using this to try to suggest that I was postponing my, my urine test, even though we talked about this months in advance. And it's something that we've also done in, in past years. Other mushers do it, and rightfully so, absolutely. We love our dogs. We don't want to you know, mush them into Noma, tough race, and wake up just a few hours later, okay, it's time to get up. And no, we want them to have a rest. And I think any musher can relate to that. Did the blood test, so the, the blood test results would have been seen by the Iditarod too? That, they that was the, I mean, that was the plan. I was working yeah. with Stu Nelson. He was, I mean, when it, this whole thing started when we were talking about hematocrit levels with Stu Nelson years ago. And they had some, some kind of data, and I was wondering if that's really true, especially how we're now racing the Iditarod. I feel like we have stronger, healthier teams at the end of the race. Look at the speeds that we're running at the end of the race. I think this is indicative of teams that are healthier. So the data that they used to have about the decreasing hematocrit in the dogs over the course of the race, I don't think that's still necessarily true. And that's part of what I wanted to look into here. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get additional information. And was this done at your own expense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those blood tests were all done. I mean, they, the Iditarod, or Stu Nelson in particular, helped me arrange some of the details. And I think he contacted the person at the lab to see if they would do it at perhaps the, at the cheaper rate, you know, whatever. I, um, yeah. But yeah, it cost me a couple thousand dollars to do this testing. Would, would those tests have it shown traces of tram at all? I, I don't know. That's a great question. That was one of the questions I asked, um, I relayed to Mark Norman is would these tests help us identify anything? Would it help us know when this was given? And they said something to the effect of, I don't think so, or we don't believe so, or something like that. It was, it was left at that. But now we're in a position that, at least now that I'm no longer restrained by the gag rule, and I'm no longer you know, having to try to let the Iditarod sort this thing out, and try to put, I mean, I can't put faith in them at this point. Um, we're now freed up to be able to start talking to some vets. Let's get some information. Let's find out what happened here. Um, this is a very concerning issue. This is a drug that's not, first of all, it's not something that would really be advantageous from what, uh, what I've heard thus far from vets is that any new vet, the new data on this drug says that it's not an effective painkiller compared to Rimadyl or any of these other drugs that are much more available. And the main, or one of the main areas that it's being prescribed for, apparently, again, I'm not a vet, is as a sedative. I mean, they use it to keep dogs from moving around too much post-surgery. Or perhaps if you're transporting them, I, I mean, I'm still trying to figure this out. And I just recently, as of less than 24 hours ago, be, become in a position that I can really start pursuing this. Because you've withdrawn. Because I've withdrawn. And also, the Iditarod's clearly not going to handle this issue correctly. Therefore, I've had to take matters into my own hands as far as, you know, the cat's out of the bag now. We're out. We're going to deal with this thing. And it frees me up. Um, so I guess to go, to go back to the timeline we were talking about, so you have this IOFC meeting. Mm -hmm. I assume you go back to Willow. When's the next time? The so I go back home. home. Um, and the next communication I have from the Iditarod is actually out camping with my daughter uh, during like the last spring mush. It would have been mid-April, um, I think April 10th or April, I mean early, I guess it would have been early April. I think it was before I went out to the, to the Kobuk. Um, early April, I got a call from Mark Nordman and he said, you know, we had a number of your dogs that tested positive. And I said, how is this possible? What is it? He says, it's tramadol. I said, what's tramadol? He says, well, it's a painkiller. It's this, okay. Um, and then he said, well, you're out much with your daughter, so you know, call me back tomorrow or whatever and try not to let this <laughs> ruin your day, which is, you know, I think, uh, I think we can all see the irony in that, right? Um, it's been absolutely miserable ever since then. I mean, well, particularly since October 9th here when this thing has um, been handled the way it has. But anyway, um, my... One of his questions is, was, is there any way that this could have been accidentally administered? I said, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll look into it. I mean, I don't know what this drug is. Um, so I talked to the people at the kennel and this is, it's incredibly unlikely that this thing could have accidentally been administered. Um, it's not something we use. Um, 
it's not something that's part of our regimen. I don't know how it would have possibly gotten into what we have. So when I called him back, I told him, I know I'm probably supposed to say, yeah, it was an accident and this thing goes away. But the truth is, it's not. We have a problem. We have a very big problem. I mean, one of the potential side effects is this thing can cause seizures in dogs. I mean, this is, my research is Google research, so I'm just going <laughs> to throw that out right there. But um, we need to have some form of security. We need to have some form of an issue. So I can't rule out that it was accidentally given, but I don't know how it possibly would have been. Uh, I, I've recently been finding out that this is a vet or a drug that the vets have on the Iditarod, um, and they're administering these drugs, you know, in a Ziploc baggie with a little white card in there. I have no idea how they went from the bottle to the white baggie, so it is possible that something was given under the wrong labeling, but I, I think that is highly unlikely. Let's just say that I think that is highly unlikely. Um, all I know is I didn't give it to my dogs. Now I understand I'm probably the only, well I am the only person in the world that knows that definitively. So that frees me up to look at the other options, which there's not too many of them, and however unlikely they may be, it has to be that, right? I mean, there is no other choice, and that's what we're now looking at. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out what the heck happened. Um, you know, the idea that it's, <clears throat> that it's impossible or so horribly unlikely that somebody would give a banned substance to somebody else's dog. In my opinion, it's no more likely that somebody would give it to somebody else's dog than that they would give it to their own dog. How this race is conducted, I think you're just assuming that there's a person out there that's willing to drug their dog to gain an advantage, which apparently we assume since we have drug testing, right? I mean, that's an assumption that's there. So if a Assuming that they're capable of giving a drug to a dog to improve their position, it makes more sense in this race to give that drug to somebody else's dog. Either a sedative that's going to you know, diminish their performance, or far more likely would be to give something to cause a positive drug test and have that person removed from the race. Now I think what Stu Nelson told me is rather enlightening, which is based on the levels that were in the dogs, you would have to be completely ignorant about this drug to think it wasn't going to cause a positive drug test. Whether you gave them a massive dose over here, or a smaller dose at this time, or a smaller dose at this time. Whenever, you would have to be completely ignorant about the drug to think it's not going to cause a positive drug test. With that information, it implies that whoever gave it to the dog knew it was going to cause a positive drug test. Now does that make the musher that's driving the team the most likely or the least likely person to have done that? Did Stu tell you that in a phone call, in an email? How that was in a phone call. Um, he then confirmed that with Stan Hooley and Chaz St. George on speakerphone. They were in the same office. In fact, I asked him to write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to Stan. I'd be interested to see if that piece of paper has survived the last 24 hours. Well, however, you will notice that in their response to Musher X's letter where I stated that, they did not deny that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, there's your confirmation. Uh, so in, in terms of tramadol, did, did you, I know you said you talked to the handlers. Do you guys keep that in your kennel at all? Have you ever used that on dogs for other reasons? I have personally never given this drug. I'm not familiar with it. We've used Rimadil, which is the doggy equivalent of IV, ibuprofen, but even that we use it a very, very, very sparingly. And mostly the value of that is as an anti-inflammatory. However, I have... Um, a homeopathic remedy, it's essentially Arnica, that I think works far more effectively as a anti-inflammatory, and we use that during the training year far more than we use anything else. Our kennel is almost entirely holistic based, right, and that's the irony of this whole thing, is that we use as few drugs as possible. Now, do you remember my lead dog, Guinness? Um, she was my golden harness winner from 2012, phenomenal mm -hmm. little dog. She had numerous puppies in my kennel, she's kind of the matriarch of the kennel. She passed away right after the 2016 Iditarod, and she had a surgery prior to that a fair bit. Um, it was, she had, um, she had a, a cancerous tumor that was removed, and I think she was prescribed this drug afterwards, but I do not think it was administered to her, I d but I don't think it's still in the kennel. Um, that was, I'm trying to figure out where, what happened on that line, but that we're talking, it was, I think that surgery was two years ago. But that's the only time that I am aware of this thing ever being in our kennel. Mm -hmm. And I found out about that, you know, after the race. 
as you know, Jen handles a vast majority of the vet care stuff, and it's not something that I was aware of until I started, you know, have we ever had this? Because that was my question. Have we ever even used this thing? Where did it come from? Right. So, so you're, so in April, we're going mm -hmm. back, you're with your daughter, you get this phone call from Mark Nordman, you ask folks in the kennel, your handlers, have we used this? Mm -hmm. Do we use this? And they say no. And, and so in your video yesterday, I believe you, you know, you told Mark this was not an accident, and I think you said there's less than a half a percent of, chan of a chance that it I, was. I do not see any possible way, all right? I can't say what didn't happen. You can't prove a negative. I can't prove I didn't give this to my dogs. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't say absolutely no, but no, this is not like, oh yeah, it would have been an easy slip up. No, that's, that didn't happen. But th what that does is it puts us in a very uncomfortable situation of looking at the other options. And I think this is something we need to take a look at. And I think we need to have some security to protect our dogs. And I've, since this incident, heard of other incidents in the Gnome Dog Yard where security, the, the lack of security, has been an issue. Now, I don't want this to this sound wrong because we have, I think, some great Iditarod volunteers who are there in the gnome dog yard and they're there and they make sure that there's no dog fights or that there's anything like that, right? They're, um, they're kind of the dog yard monitors. But they can't monitor 500 dogs. I mean, that, it's possible that there would be 500 dogs in that yard at one time. There's no way they can monitor that many dogs and all the people coming and going and the people that are supposed to be in that dog yard are the mushers and their handlers. And you'll have, you know, I mean, well, how they do it, I mean, you'll have these eight spots are mine. The next eight spots are my dad's over here. The next eight spots are Nick Pettit and then Jesse Royer. I mean, we're all in there. All of our handlers are in there. So why the monitors wouldn't think twice if your competitors are handlers and they don't know who's helping who. Um, so they do a great job of, you know, watching the dogs and they say, oh, so-and-so was coughing. Okay, great. Thanks for the information. And I really appreciate them doing that. But we need to have a camera in there. I mean, I think this could have been cleared up a lot easier. Can you explain, so, to people who have not seen the gnome dog lot, just like what it looks yeah. like? So we have a number of shipping containers that are spaced out with a long ground chain in between them. The shipping containers and then the snow pushed up on the sides serves as a wind block. And then the dogs are going to be resting on straw or in their crates, um, which we oftentimes open up so they can climb in and out. Um, and those, those chains are what, 20, 20 dog long? chains, right? There's, there'll be 20 dogs on one long tether um, with aisles in between so that the mushers can come and go and the people can come and go. Um, but I mean, it's not uncommon to see a couple hundred dogs and 20 or 30 people in the dog yard easy at any given time. And there's a fence around the dog lot, right? Um, they push up the snow banks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's access on two sides and they do have some, like, some ropes in between them with some snow fencing hanging down. But if you watch the Gnome Dog Yard, people come and go. I'll walk in there with reporters following me, and we'll go right through there. And you know, friends, you'll be having a conversation with somebody. It's not a secure area by any stretch of the imagination. They don't. I mean, I've never worn any sort of armband or badge or anything that denotes who I am. But also, like I said, not just your competitors, but also your competitors' handlers and helpers and volunteers and even their sponsors, etc are going to have those same exact armbands, and they are supposed to be in there. They're going to be in there taking care of their dogs. So a team that finishes right next to you is going to be parked right next to you, and they're going to have all their people right there with them. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Yeah. After you found out about the positive drug test from Mark Nordman, what was communication like between April and October? Um, a number of phone calls between Mark Nordman and myself. There were some spans of time where there wasn't much for communication. Um, and granted, I was busy at part of the times. Norman was busy on parts of the times. We were back and forth. Um, there were some emails that went back and forth. Um, I don't know where this information went specifically. Um, and then I heard from Nordman that, you know, this is what we decided or this is what we're going to do and pretty much said it's over. I mean, is after the last email I sent them and they're, you know, I'm kind of waiting to hear their response and they said, okay, we got your information. This thing's over. And again, I mean, I had 10, I mean, probably at least 10 hours of phone calls with Norman. So I'm, I'm trying to you know, remember exactly what, what each one, and that's another thing. Where's the documentation? But I mean, here we are. Where, where is it? Where's anything from the Iditarod? 
there was no formal process. So anyway, after, after we go through this thing, he tells me that um, you know, this thing's decided. The Iditarod's not taking any action or anything. And my understanding was that, OK, whew, they believe me. They got it. They understand it. The evidence is apparently enough that they see that you would have to be absolutely retarded to give this drug to your own dog because it's a sedative. It's an ineffective painkiller. That's what the research says now. And it was given when you know you're going to be tested. And looking at the half-life, I think, I think it is most likely that it was given after the finish. So there's, I mean, all of those options, this wasn't done to gain a competitive advantage. That much we know. Whoever did administer it or however it was administered, it was not done to gain a, an advantage. We know that. Um, so he says, you know, this is, this is done. Okay. Do you know when that was? Like what month? I think the last email I saw was beginning of June. Um, so this would have been shortly after that, I suspect. I, I don't know specifically the date. Again, we don't, we don't have the, you know, the records. There was never a panel that I'm aware of. I was never presented to a panel. I never gave a testimony or anything to anybody but Mark Nordman. Um, you know, even the, the emails. I think one email he requested that I send to Chaz St. George because he was gone or something. So one of the emails I sent to Chaz, and, and again, I don't know what was done with this information after that. Much of that email was, you know, um, kind of just guessing. Are these other options? Or could this have happened? I don't know. I mean, you can only imagine how difficult this situation is to be pinned with what is probably one of the most heinous crimes you can possibly commit, drugging your dogs here. I mean, as far as the race is concerned, right? As far as the sport's concerned, there's, you don't, there's certain lines you do not cross. To be accused of that and somehow try to prove that you're innocent, trying to prove that you didn't do something. It's an incredibly difficult situation. Anyway, so the next I heard was October 9th when this press release came out. Actually, I heard about it a little bit later. Um, I was not aware that anything was coming up. Do you have that press release from October 9th? I do, yeah. Is it this one right here? Mm -hmm. And based on their wording, which this, I was, I was, I was going to say I was as shocked when I saw this as when, it, as when I heard for the first time in April, but that's probably not quite true. But uh, the revised rule has been put in place because several dogs and a single mushers team in the 2017 race tested positive for a prohibitive substance. In consultation with legal counsel, the board of directors determined that the ITC would likely not be able to prove intent. It then goes on to outline or to state the new rule, which the key change in the new rule is that it puts the entire burden of proof to the level of clear and convincing evidence on the musher. Now, any rational person that reads this rule comes to what conclusion? They come to the conclusion that the ITC thinks you're guilty and that they weren't able to prosecute you because they couldn't prove intent. What just happened? That was my thing. Was, are you serious? This is where this is going to go? I then start hearing that within days of this release, people are calling back to confirm that it was me. Hmm. My belief is that whatever happened and how the drug got into the dogs, that aside, how the race handled this issue was malicious, particularly starting with this press release right here where they state, I mean, it's pretty clear that their position is that they think you're guilty, but they can't prove it. That's essentially the stance they took. So I feel like there are certain people that wanted it to imply, and look at all the musher's comments prior to yesterday, right? The guilty musher should come forward. We want to know who the guilty musher is. The assumption was that you were guilty. You're done. There, <laughs> Where do you prove otherwise? So I feel that what happened with this press release is that they wanted it to be implied that the person was guilty because this takes all the focus away from any possible foul play, any wrongdoing that the race could have done. They then intentionally, I feel, that my name, or at least at minimum, they knew my name was going to get tied to this thing in a matter of time. A couple weeks later, if you look at their letter to the IOFC, they directly tie me to this. 
by saying that this was the musher that was doing the special blood test. Hint, hint, remember him? Hundreds of people knew about that test. I am the only person that did a blood test in Nome. Hmm. So it went from me suspecting that this was being leaked to them confirming it, essentially. I feel that that was handled the way it was as, well, if we're going to have this situation, we might as well kill two birds with one stone. We might as well discredit Dallas and not worry about him protesting the board, which I've done in the past. After this came out, where's the 17th one? I think it's under oh, there's here. another one there. Okay, sorry. Not to be rifling through oh, the papers, no, you're fine. but I think I'm assuming that's one. what they're here for? Yeah. All right, so after the October 9th press release, I became aware of it. I started calling whoever I could talk to. I could talk to Maury Craig. I talked to Stu Nelson. I talked to Stan Hooley. I talked to Chaz St. George. Um, talked to Nordman, of course. I talked to Wade Mars, who I will say is the only board member, the only board member that I spoke to directly more than an hour before this final press release that tied my name to it. The only board member. By the time the board members spoke directly to me, one, they had already decided that they were going to put out a press release by the, stating my name by the end of that conference call. They had already decided that by the time they spoke to me. But also by that time, they had let out this press release and rule change, this press release and this press release. Mm -hmm. They made these three statements, very clearly defining the Iditarod's position, changing race rules without ever having spoken to me, without me ever appearing before any formal review board or panel. They, at minimum, implied and certainly allowed the assumption that the musher was guilty. And what did they do to prevent that? What did they do to find out whether I was or wasn't guilty? They led me to believe that they believed that I was innocent, or that they believed I was innocent, right? So after this October 9th press release comes out, and it pretty clearly says they believe there is a guilty musher in the top 20. They just stuck this on all the top 20 mushers. And I understand those mushers' anger. I understand better than any of them how unpleasant it is to be falsely accused and not have a way to prove that it wasn't you. That's why mushers were furious about this, and rightfully so. I don't blame them one bit. That when you get this, what is that supposed to mean? That's not a solution. That's not an answer. So I spoke to the people with, with Dead Dead I spoke to Stan. I spoke to Chaz. I went in and I spoke with them in person discussed things. And I said, you release the rest of the information or else I will. I also contacted you through Wade Mars, he can verify, and I texted him a text. And I said, call Tegan, read her this text, saying that I wanted to speak with you anonymously. The reason I wanted to speak with you anonymously is because this information, in the eyes of all my peers, all the mushers, I felt needed to be out there, needed to be absorbed unbiasedly. That's how the Iditarod board should have done it. The board should have been forced to make a decision without knowing if it was Aaron Burmeister's brother that had had the positive drug test or Andy Baker's brother that had the positive drug test. They should have been presented with the facts and made a decision not knowing that it was a musher that protested them, that called for the resignation in the past. But instead, the first thing they heard was that it was my name. And then after that, whatever evidence they heard, how much do you think that applied? How much do you think that stuck? So I told them if they don't release the rest of the information by 4 p.m. on October 17th, I would. I was then talking to Chaz about what is it going to say? You know, what, what's in there? I mean, I'm trying to figure out because apparently what I was told before wasn't the case based on the October 9th press release. While I'm on the phone with Chaz, he says, well, and I, I think Chaz was trying to do the right thing perhaps. I mean, he was discussing with me. I don't know. He was certainly being polite to me on the phone as we were talking about it. But then mid-conversation, he says, well, it's already out. And I said, what's already out? And that's when I see this one. That does not clear up any of the issues. It simply states that it pretty much entrenches their position before. So it went from being kind of a little white lie, perhaps, on the side of the Iditarod, implying that I was guilty, knowing that it would stick to me, knowing that it would shut me up, or they thought it would 
to entrenching their position and stating that it's a class 4 opioid drug that's used to control moderate to severe pain. Um, certainly nothing to clear up the issue, but only escalate it. That's when I then, shortly after that, released a letter anonymously to the IOFC, um, trying to bring a little bit more of this stuff to light. That was followed up by a response um, yeah, I think we have that, that unequivocally denies everything that I said, yeah. except for there's no actual anything to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I have that one. I have half of it. I don't know where the first page is. All right. So I think this is a... <clears throat> so I think one of the most telling things in this statement, this is something that I had actually written down earlier when I was working on um, a different, a different release. I mean, and part of this was I'm just trying to figure out what's going on myself, trying to formulate thoughts, trying to understand what's going on, and then trying to convey this to my to my fellow mushers here as well. But one of the suspicions I had is why did they choose to handle it this way? Aside from I understand their position against against me. That's, I mean, I think that's a little bit uh, beyond just a disagreement. I feel like this is a little bit below the belt, uh, more than a little bit. Um, but why? Why don't they acknowledge that there's a problem? Why don't they acknowledge that you know, tampering is at least possible? And they claim that they did by listing in this rule, um, and this I'm sure will be in their later stuff, but they list in this uh, October 9th press release, it also says in there towards the end that you know, tampering with other dogs and equipment is strictly prohibited, which is already in the rules. They just moved it in the rules. Mm -hmm. But that was their statement. Oh, we did address that. We told people not to. Not we're going to do anything to enforce it. That's like saying, you know, telling the NFL, here's the rules, but we're not going to send refs out there to enforce it. You guys just, we expect you to play by the rules, right? Anyway, my suspicion was that they didn't want to have to address this, which in their, their unequivocal denying of everything that Musher X said, um, which I could go through paragraph by paragraph and address here, but I think the most telling is the last paragraph. Um, ITC or, I'm sorry, it is correct that ITC evaluated, evaluated taking measures to increase the security of mushers' bags at food drops and surveillance at checkpoints, but at this point in time, its budget does not permit what could be substantial cost increases for that type of 24-7 security. ITC believes that the mushers themselves can adopt practices which minimize any risk of tampering. So essentially what they're saying is that they did acknowledge that they have a security problem. And what they determined is that it might be too much trouble and it might be too expensive, and so the musher should just deal with it. But out the other hand, they're handing us this rule that says the mushers have to prove with clear and convincing evidence that we didn't do it, but yet what they're willing to do to protect us is they're gonna suggest some practices that we could adopt to minimize risk. Mm -hmm. That's what mushers are pissed off about is that they are not willing to protect us or our dogs or our reputations. We are allowed to pour our lives into this thing and they will not do anything to protect us. As soon as they find out that they cannot prove that we're guilty, as soon as they find out that they cannot make that stick, their obligation is done, they're just gonna drop it. What about the part where they could have proven that I was innocent and saved the sport? What about that part? What about the part that as soon as they can't prove that, it's, that I'm guilty, they're then, then just going to kind of distribute that assumed guilt over the top 20, which I don't think they intended for it to stay that way. Because, like I said, within days of that press release, people were calling to confirm that it was me. Hmm. They weren't asking. They were saying. Where did they get that information? The ITC is the only people that knew. I can assure you I didn't tell them, <laughs> right? So I have my suspicions on that side as well. Incidentally, every report that, I, that directly came back to me came from the Fairbanks area, which is interesting. But yeah. phones, modern technology, it could have been anywhere. But that's where, that's where I was, people were saying that I heard it from this person in Fairbanks uh, who had heard it from somebody locally mm -hmm. apparently. 
Mm -hmm. um, or was it when you say people were calling Iditarod to get their confirmation? I had are you a talking person, like reporters or are you talking just mushers or members of the public? Or? Individuals. One of them was a a mutual sponsor of myself and a couple others um, that contacted me and said, I just heard this. And he, it was not a question. I mean, he knew for a fact. That's how this thing is coming out, right? And then I think their anti-musher X letter is pretty well ties it. You can see in there where it talks about the, uh, I think this is the one in yesterday, right? Oh, right, is this, this, I think this maybe this is the start of the statement that goes through the vet testing procedures. Oh yeah, maybe it was. But why would that have been? Oh, they I know what it is. They one out in the yep. morning and yep. one in the afternoon. So it was October 22nd that it went to the IOFC, but it was sent out as a release on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, I'm trying to see where it, I think it's the first paragraph. Okay, this paragraph right here. Prior to the 2017 race, Musher X requested a delay in the collection of the urine sample. I'm gonna turn it this way so I can actually read it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Samples by the ITC drug testing team after the finish of the race. Um, we requested that it be done at six hours, yes. But that is not a delay. As we look at this rule right here, what does it say right there on, uh, is this October 9th? Do you have the second page of this one? I think it might be on the back. Oh, I didn't realize that, okay. Dogs are subject to the collection of urine or blood samples at the discretion of the testing veterinarian at any point from the pre-race examination until six hours after the team's finish. Do you know how they set that time? How they set what time it's taken? They talk to the musher mm -hmm. and they say, when do you want to do it? So before the race, when we were talking about doing these blood samples with them, additional testing, <laughs> we determined that we wanted to do that at the six hour mark, which we've done that in the past as well. But clearly here, they have no problem explaining it in the light that we made a special request to push that test back. It's clear why they put it in there. They're saying that it was done intentionally to avoid a drug test. That's what they're saying. Um, what I wanna know is where's the proof? Show me something. That's why we're calling for transparency. That's what we're looking for, is if you're gonna make these statements, as the ITC, as the governing body, if you're gonna make these statements, you had better be ready to back them up. Um, explaining that there were other tests that were already ordered by Musher X and that Musher X wanted to make sure that the dogs were sufficiently rested for both the urine draw and the additional tests. All right, so many people knew about the additional text, tests that were being done. When Wade Mars received this from them, he reported later to me that he read it and he says, I can't say this. This, this directly ties you to that. I mean, he knew instantly that this was tying me to this case. So we're not talking about them subtly leaking out information. Individual board members that are unhappy with me because I've protested their actions and their votes in the past and the way that they've handled issues, which is something that I feel that the governed should have the opportunity to do to question how the people governing them conduct themselves, whether they're acting ethically, whether our representatives are in fact representing us or falsely representing us, which has been the case a number of times where things are reported to the board that the, the mushers think, except for the mushers don't. He thinks this, that's the problem. So it's no longer speculation that they're tying me to this. It's pretty directly done. So if they're going to tie me to something that says this, that pretty clearly says you're guilty, at minimum, they did nothing to allow me to prove my innocence. They did nothing to find out if I was innocent or try to assist in that. They did nothing once it was widely believed. Look at any of the musher's remarks. The guilty musher should come forward. They did nothing to say, no, 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 I'm sorry. We didn't say that he was guilty. Where is that press release? They follow up their October 9th one with one on the 17th that just restates the exact same thing. That's what I'm talking about.
they're willing to throw you under the bus because they thought that this would discredit me and that it's going to limit my ability to ever make another protest like the phones where I had a petition at the request and with the cooperation of many mushers. It's not that this was my, my issue, but I did end up spearheading it. I believed in it fully. I still do. But this was a representative of all of us, all the mushers. But they saw me as the one that they could take down. What has the impact been on you at this point? So it sounds like you were receiving Look at calls. Me. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I haven't slept in two weeks. I have never been this tired in my life. I've run. I don't even know how many I did rods. Ten, eleven. But this has. This is a whole nother level. The emotional stress on this whole thing, where everything that you, I poured my life into this for ten years. This is the only thing that I do. This is my career. This is my entire life. And because a few people on the board disagree with me, we should be able to disagree. But this is how I feel is that because of that, that whole thing can be not just brought into question, but it's, you're done. You're crucified. And they're not going to do anything to protect you. I have spent the last two weeks, I haven't eaten. <laughs> I haven't slept. I am exhausted. In the last 24 hours, for the first time, I actually have somebody else that's fighting this thing with me. There are the other mushers. I have been swamped with <laughs> everybody I care about, I guess. Um, my fellow competitors, mushers supporting me, saying, we believe you. We do not doubt what you're saying. We've seen this from the other side. We've seen this in other issues. We have other mushers talking about issues they've had with the board. Talk to Ramey Smith. Ask him about his issues with the board. If you think this is outrageous, if you think this is impossible, talk to them. What I'm finding out is I'm not the only one. And that's the only reason I'm able to still function somewhat today is because I have people that I care about and respect that are finally in my corner. And I just, I just want to say thank you to all those, those people. You know, I talked to Ali Zirkel last night and Alan Moore, and I respect those people so much. And I just, just hearing somebody say, we believe you, it makes a world of difference. And that's the only reason I'm able to be here right now doing this. You know, Jeff King, I can race against him. We can disagree. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we respect each other. You know what? Yeah. That's the type of people I want to be around. That's the type of people this race deserves to have on the board. People that have integrity. They can disagree with you. I am sure that if Jeff King and I sat down and discussed politics, it would be ugly. But yet, on the things that matter here, when it comes to this race, we have integrity, and we're going to say the truth, and we can disagree with each other, but we can be friends. That's not the board we have. These mushers are good people. The fans are good people. The volunteers are good people. That's the Iditarod, the state. That's the Iditarod. That is what I have loved since I was five years old. Why should this thing be ripped apart because of a good old boys club on the board that are, why are they there? I, I don't understand. Is it a power thing? I, I don't understand. But we deserve better than this. We need to be able to be protected. We need to know that we are not going to be falsely accused. And we need to have a way to defend ourselves. And whatever people end up believing about me, fine. If there can be some good from this, if the race heals because of this, and if for the first time in 20 years we aren't going down, down, down. You probably know better than I, this purse is lower than it's been since when? I think it was in the 1990s. Tell me one thing that this organization, the authors of that, has done well in the last five years. Tell me one issue that they handled well. I don't see it. We deserve, this race deserves leadership that can do what we need to have done. And that's clearly not these people. And I don't, on the most part, I think there's some good people in there, sure. But this board is controlled by a few, there's a few problems. The mushers do not trust the board. That trust has been 
broken so many times that it is not coming back with these same faces. So all grievances aside, the mushers will not trust the board until there are new faces on that board. That's the only solution. Incidentally, I had that same conversation with one of the board members in Nome, and they agreed fully. And that is, I said nothing personal, but can you see any solution to our problem that does not involve putting new members on the board to give the mushers at least hope that they're going to be listened to and that there can be communication and that these people actually have their best interest in mind. And they tried to say for a while, well, the mushers need to communicate better with the board. And I said, specifically on this phone issue, which is what we're talking about, how could the mushers have possibly communicated their wants more clearly? We had a petition that said clearly what we wanted. We had the public comment session where we said clearly what we wanted. We spoke as clearly as possible, so at some point this board has to take responsibility for its actions. I would say the only thing they've done well in the last five years is shift blame. What do you do now? What are you planning to do now? Well, I kind of have just jumped. I've jumped off the cliff. I gave the idea to the middle finger and said, I'm going to tell the truth. I withdrew my name from the race based on how they handled this issue. And quite honestly, just out of protest of the whole dang thing. Because the Iditarod has, when I say the Iditarod, the board, has been operating under the assumption that mushers will kick and scream, but at the end of the day, they're all going to show up right there on 4th Avenue because they have nowhere else to go. And that's true. They have all the power. But we, the mushers, decide to subjugate ourselves to them when we sign up. We've made that decision. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to put what I know to be a corrupt group of people in a position of authority over myself. We have the power. We are the mushers. We are the Iditarod, not the board. They're not the Iditarod. We, the Iditarod, the fans, the volunteers, the mushers, deserve the people that are in the position of authority to make decisions, to have integrity, and have our best interest in mind. We deserve that. So what do I do next? Like I said, I've jumped and I have what, what gave me the, what pushed me over the edge, what gave me the confidence to do it, I guess, is that, like I said in the video, I may never race a dog race again. I would not be surprised if the Iditarod comes out this afternoon and says, actually, we decided that Dallas is guilty. What else, I mean, what else can they do? That wouldn't surprise me. Because their whole play has been to discredit me because I've spoken out against the board. I'm speaking out big time now. All they can do is try to continue to discredit me. I hope, for their sakes, that they have more integrity than that because that will not go down well. But I may never race another race. I have spent 10 years making this my profession. I may never bring in one cent based off of mushing after this. But in 30 years, in 40 years, I will still be able to look in the mirror and know that I was honest to myself, that I did not give up because it would have been easier. I did not sit quietly in the corner and let this corruption blow over. That's what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to just subtly take the blame and not say anything. That's not me. I don't, I don't care if I end up racing sailboats or working in Walmart or whatever, but at least I'll be able to look at myself. And I think there can be good that comes from this for the mushers. And I apologize to the mushers again for the shit storm that this is going to bring on everybody. But in, when this blows over, whether that's five years or this winter, I don't know. When it blows over, I will do everything in my power to make sure that Alaska continues to be the capital of long distance racing and that we host the greatest thousand mile race in the world. And I hope its name is still the Iditarod. I'll do what I can. So will we be hearing more from you in the next few weeks in terms of are you going to try to, you know, are you still investigating this for yourself? I'm going to try to survive. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I am dying here. <laughs> 
piece by piece. I'm so beat up right now. I mean, I'm on the ragged edge. And like I said, I jumped and I have faith that the truth carries a lot of weight. I have nothing to hide. So I'm not gonna sit there and, and be supposed guilty. And if there's 1% of the people that believe me, then I have, would rather have the respect of 1% that know the truth than a dishonest admiration of 99. Because truth matters. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I hope, that now that I've jumped, I'm hoping the mushers will catch me. I'm hoping the fans will. That's all I can do. And if they don't, then at least I will die honestly. <laughs> what more can you do? I don't know where this thing's gonna lead. I don't know what's gonna happen. I do wanna find out what the hell happened out there. It scares the crap out of me that somebody's able to give this to my dogs. It's possible, yes, it is possible that this was somehow accidentally done. That is possible. But it is equally or more likely that this was done maliciously. I personally believe that this was a, a move of opportunism. I don't think that this, this is a drug that people would have, that a human would have prescribed to them. It's a drug that somebody may have planned to give to their own dogs after the drug test to help them rest. It's a sedative to put them to sleep. It is possible. I feel that for whatever reason, somebody had this drug, it was standing there in a dog yard that's vacant at 10.30, 11 at night in Nome. There's not a soul around and took the opportunity. That's what I believe happened. Who, why? I, I shouldn't say that's what I believe happened. That is probably the most likely scenario. I should probably put it that way because I honestly don't know. It, just to talk about one more time, so so when you're having this, you know, these hours of conversations that you said with race officials after April, before June, I mean, what are you talking about? Are you going through scenarios? Are you like offering mostly, to do things? Or yeah, I, mostly what went down on this thing is I would, you know, go through this thing like, all right, logically look at this drug. I don't know where they came up with the 15 hours. If you Google tramadol and dogs half life, right? you see that the timeline on this drug is incredibly short. We're talking 1.3 to two hours is the half-life, right? So it's gonna depreciate quickly from there. The instrument was noted to be saturated slash overloaded with tramadol, not the metabolites, which means that this thing was still big in their system at this point. Moreover, the studies that have been done with dogs have been done with beagles, literally. Not a sled dog that just ran a thousand miles. Don't we all know that the sled dogs have the most amazing metabolism? That when a dog, everybody's said, yeah, of course, if a dog's active, they're gonna burn this stuff more quickly. It's gonna go through their system even faster. So I'm talking about this sort of stuff and Mark's saying, yeah, uh-huh, okay. And then we have another conversation next week and the week after that. So I don't know where that went. Did anybody else hear about it? Was that related to the board? I was never given an opportunity to have my expert vet come in and say, this is what happened, this is what happened here. I never had the opportunity to do any of that and present it as facts to somebody to then take all that information. So was what I was saying being cut into a, a five minute report to somebody? I don't even know if that happened. I don't know. I would love to find out. But my impression at this point is this thing was kind of kicked around and discussed and once they decided they couldn't prove I was guilty, then it just kind of got dropped. Yeah, the Musher X statement says that you have to take a, a polygraph test, is that I did. True? What did they say? Um, my understanding was that it wasn't necessary. I mean, I sent it to them in an email and that was one of the things that made me believe that they thought I was innocent, is that they weren't requesting this stuff. They weren't asking for more proof or more evidence. So I was led to believe that I was, I thought I had been cleared. I thought they, they, who I don't even know who they is supposed to be. I mean, at that point, I think, uh, I think the people that were aware of it were um, the ITC staff, many of them. Um, I know that Andy Baker and Danny Siebert were brought in at some point, and I don't know if they were part of the deciding situation or not, but whenever the decision was made in there, it was, it was made, and that's where there's some, 
a little bit incongruous with what then came out here because this is what the board put out. But the board's information came from whom? Because they weren't privy to the first round of information. So they're writing a rule. They're changing our race rules, implying that the musher is guilty. But what evidence did they have? They're then making all these other decisions in a PR way. What information did they have? Other than they knew it was me. And there's probably many of them that said, well, of course he did it, with no more evidence than my name. So I don't know what the next step is. Like I said, I'm just I'm taking it one step at a time. I have talked to other mushers, and I value the other mushers' opinions. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of good recommendations come forward. From mushers. And probably some actions. I think that this is probably, while this is a more publicly seen issue, I think there's going to be a lot of mushers that can attest to similar issues. For example, we had a very unfortunate situation with drop dogs coming home from the Iditarod last year. Um, dogs, one dog died. Um, one dog, I think, had a broken leg. Another dog, they confirmed, had heat stroke. Um, I've heard different reports. Again, because of how things are handled, we don't know what we can believe, what we can't. Half the times the rumors are, you know, worse than the truth. But uh, mushers weren't notified. I don't know if I had a dog on that plane. I didn't know. I think that was one of the things that the Iditarod really, or the ITC, IOFC really um, drove home in Nome is that we've got to know what happened. But this is not news to the mushers that the ITC is going to say as little as they can or they're going to cover something up. And like I said, I apologize for the, the you know, shit storm this is bringing on mushing as a whole, but I can't. I can't sit back and let this happen. And I, I think as much as it's going to hurt for this to go down, I think our only healthy way forward is to resolve this issue. Ignoring it doesn't fix it. Before this, were you concerned about someone giving your dogs a prohibited drug when you weren't looking? Was that something that mushers talked about? Yeah. No, I mean, weird? it was something that was discussed, particularly, I mean, particularly in the position that I've been in. Um, I think it's, I, I don't think that 99% of the mushers would do that. But I think there is a percent. I think there is 1% that would. Um, and it's a concern when you're in White Mountain and it's 3 in the morning and your dog team's sitting there, and not just your dog team, not just your best friends, but your entire life, your entire career, your entire reputation. And you walk up to the checkpoint in White Mountain that's a quarter mile away from your dog team, and there is not a soul on that river, not one person. Now. There could be a thousand reasons why somebody would feel justified to do this. Perhaps one of your competitors, I'd, like I said, it's not an appetizing feeling, but competitors or one of their handlers even, or anybody, I could see them justifying saying, well, they're probably already drugging, so I'm just going to make sure they get caught. I could see that sort of a justification. Criminals justify a lot of their actions on some really strange <laughs> parameters. I could see that happening. I could see a number of different issues. Um, you know, I somewhat publicly embarrassed some of our board members just by speaking the truth. Um, I could see that being a motivator. I don't know. I really don't know. And I, I want to be very careful about accusing somebody because I don't know. And after what I've been through, I should know better than anybody that nobody deserves to be falsely accused without the ability to defend themselves. That's not pleasant. No. And, and so throughout the, te or throughout the test, throughout the race, dogs are randomly drug tested, right? You know mm -hmm. you're going to get tested in Nome. Nome is the only guaranteed drug test. Right. Yeah. Were your dogs tested at other checkpoints throughout the race that you know of? 
I don't know. I don't remember. I know, I mean, they have been, but mm -hmm. I don't remember this year from last year. But yeah, I've been tested in Nikolai. I know that's a pretty common one. Um, I know I've been tested in Takatna. Um, I know I've been tested in Ruby in the past. I think it was Ruby. I mean, I've been tested out there numerous times, but that's the other part of this whole thing is if we want to have a drug testing system that works, there's two parts. One, we actually need to be able to catch somebody using a drug to gain an advantage, and we need to be able to eliminate the possibility or minimize the possibility that somebody else did it, right? I think an important point that everybody is overlooking so far is that when you have a positive test in this event, you have proof of a crime. That is finding the dead body, is having the positive test. It says nothing about who committed the crime. Now, if this was me personally, sure. All right, I know, at least I have reasonable control over what I ingest, um, that's fine. If it's a racehorse, that you're watching it, you know, supervising that thing constantly, until it's on the track. When it's on the track, it has a person on it, and thousands of people are watching it. When it comes off the track, it's supervised. Okay, fine. It's reasonable that the person who has the horse should be able to control what it consumes. In the Iditarod, that is not a reasonable assumption. So what we have is proof of a crime, or, or proof of an incident, could have been accidental, right? If you find a dead body, you don't know if the person just died of natural causes or if they were murdered or whatever. But just because there's a positive test does not implicate anybody in this event. Have you been told of tests? I mean, is it I did a drug procedure to call you and say, hey, when we tested you in Ruby, your, your drug test was negative, or do you only hear if it's a positive result? Have you heard about results? I've never been contacted about the drug test previously. Um, I don't know how this stuff's supposed to be handled, you know? I'm, I'm a dog musher. I don't know what the legal process is supposed to be. Um, I don't know. I've, I've never been contacted about it before, right? So, so no, they don't call you and tell you you had a you didn't have a positive. Um, this is the first time I've been contacted by them on anything, and the ITC claims that they've never had a positive drug test, which a lot of mushers say that's not the case. I, I don't know, um, but it is interesting. Why this one? Why now? Yeah. Uh, and, and last thing, so you, I think in the musher X statement you mentioned, you know, there was no sample B test done mm -hmm. in, in the presence of you or someone associated yep. with your team. Um, and you call that standard procedure. Is that standard procedure for the Iditarod or for what well, exactly? What we found out is the Iditarod doesn't have standard procedure, right? Because by their own admission, they've never had this. So how would they have a procedure? That is, I believe, um, standard procedure in other drug testing. Um, if you read the Iditarod's response to that letter, they very feebly state that I never requested that a B sample be tested. And my question is, okay, when was I supposed to do that? Before my hearing? When was I supposed to request that this be done? When were we supposed to submit evidence? By what timeline? And for whom to view? When? Right? So if they say, okay, we think it's possible that you did this intentionally, we're going to have a a full-on trial here, okay, then we would get everything lined out and you would have people that know what proper drug testing procedure is, advise you on that. You would have your expert vets come in and say, look at the levels of this. This is ridiculous. This was clearly given after the race and was obviously going to cause a positive drug test. What sane musher would give a drug to their dog knowing it was going to cause a positive drug test? I have 10 times more to lose in any single race than I could possibly gain in any single race. Because if you have a positive test at any point in your career, it brings, in, brings everything else you've done into question. So again, why now? Why is this issue here? Why is it now? And I think it has a lot to do with what's going on in the board. It may have to do with this race, I don't know. I want to be careful not to you know, implicate anybody else because I don't think anybody should be falsely accused on this stuff.
Is there anything else you want to say that I didn't ask you about that we haven't talked about? Not that I can think of right now, other than, um, you know, again, that's just been, it's been very, very helpful, the amount of people that have, you know, mushers come forward and said, we believe you, we know you did not do this, we know what's going on with the Iditarod, we're here. That has been very, very helpful on this whole thing. And I appreciate that. You know, one of them, and I think this shows some integrity, one of the people who recently sent me a message um, that said effectively just that, I believe you, I know you didn't do this, I'm here for you, was a person that the last text they sent was not kind because of these same issues, was a previous, he had previously been involved with the administration of the IOFC and ITC. And was no longer in that position, largely based on, again, some of my testimony having dealt with them. But he was big enough to recognize that we can have our issues, we can disagree with how this race is managed, we can argue about different issues, that's fine. But at the end of the day, we have integrity. I know he wouldn't do it. He knows that I did not do this. So things like that. There are good people in there. There are good people around the sport, and that board should be filled with people with integrity that have the best interest in mind for the race and have the ability and the vision to take this race where it needs to be in the next 10 years. Can you, as, in terms of like messages to your fans or sponsors, what are you telling them in terms of what's next for you as a musher? Are you keeping all your, you know, I assume day by day your day largely revolves around mushing. Will it, will oh, it continue yeah. in the yeah, future? I mean, this is the thing. Is that, An Iditarod musher is a musher 365. So yeah, we show up here on, in March. We run the Iditarod in March. Um, the cameras are on in March. But um, you're a musher year round. And if you don't love the lifestyle, you're not going to be a musher for long. If you're doing all that just to be able to run the race, <laughs> you're not going to be in it for too long. So. I don't know. It's one of those things, like I said, I've jumped. I'm off the cliff. I'm going to speak the truth. And wherever this lands us, it lands us. But I don't know where this takes me. I don't know. But I, you can't be frozen and not able to take a step just because you don't know where it takes you. If it is the right direction and it is the right step, take it. And even if that leads you to a very bad place, you know the decisions you made in the process were made with integrity. That's the only thing I can do at this point. I don't know where this leads me. I don't know where this goes. And it's right now, I don't have to know. And I'm just going to have to be okay with that.